So hear now the very word of God as it is given to us in the Gospel of Luke, reading from the 8th chapter, starting in verse 32 and reading through to verse 39. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear, for he got, and so he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. And may the Lord bless this, this hugely impactful word to us this morning. Give me the words to clearly um, bring the meaning out. Let's pray and ask for that. Father, we ask for illumination, and I ask for clear words. I ask for concise and clear speech so that I can articulate the, the beautiful, not just the, the scene that's before us, but also the, the deep spiritual meaning that's all wrapped up, not just in this part of the story, but the entire story going all the way back to your parable of the soils and the sower. So Lord, I pray your guidance, your direction, your words, and your illumination so that we might truly understand this and apply it uh, in, in our hearts and in our lives. In Christ's name we pray, amen. As you might have detected from that prayer, I've got a big task in front of me. I need to kind of sort of bring this entire epic story together. And as I was thinking about ways that I would do that, my, my mind just stumbled upon that third chapter of John that Brother Freddie read you earlier. Because John so clearly states exactly what's happening, not only in the parable of the sower, but also in this epic voyage to the other side, that I thought that we would start out just by rereading that. Then I'm, now I'm going to add a previous verse to it back from the beginning of chapter 3. But just so that you have this, this idea of exactly what we are seeing graphically displayed for us, let's read these words of John once again. First of all, starting when he is, he's, he's talking to Nicodemus, this Pharisee who comes in the night to see him, and he tells Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, the regeneration of the soul being absolutely vital. And then jumping to verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, most people just kind of pull that verse out of context. I mean, they love that verse, and they don't read anything that follows. But Jesus puts it in a vital context. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light. Because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light. Lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light. So that it might be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Now, that's a beautiful statement of the gospel. I mean, it's just, it's both sides of the gospel. But I want you to, in sort of a way, when I'm going to go back over it, to superimpose upon that statement the parable of the sower. Because Jesus is saying exactly the same thing in that parable as far as the light going into the darkness. And then I want you to superimpose on that the actual enactment of that as the disciples and Jesus get into a boat and go to the other side and meet that scary demon-possessed man 
in the Gentile graveyard. I mean, they're all talking about the same thing. They're all talking about the battle plan of the kingdom of God and how Jesus is going to take the world by storm by introducing a speck of light, a mustard seed's worth, and then watching as that spreads throughout the world. Well, one of the ways that's going to happen One of the vital, crucial ways that we're going to see in this passage is through the sustainable fruit of the sower. And that that is going to be graphically described to us. And it's at the very core of God's plan to bring the world into submission to his son, Jesus Christ. Now, let's go back. You, you know that parable of the sower. We've looked and we've talked about it for weeks and weeks and weeks. And we've talked about it sort of in two different ways. One, as that battle plan. And this is very, very much, God, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. The sower went out to sow his seed. And the world is the field and the seed is the gospel, the light of Jesus Christ. The sower is the son of God that God sent into the world. It, it, it's right there for us. Now, also, as part of that, uh, that very important parable, um, we learned that there were different kinds of soils there, and not every soil was going to receive the gospel, that some soils would reject it, some soils would be shallow, some soils would be in the thorns. And we're actually going to see that enacted for us in our text for this morning. But there's one aspect of the parable that John doesn't mention, at least not in this passage. And that's what we, di- we discussed earlier, that, that this was a sustainable farm. That's kind of modern lingo, but a sustainable farm is a farm that sustains itself year after year. And so therefore, every year when the, when the, the fruit would be born from the good soil a hundredfold, the farmer would take a portion of that fruit and well, most of it he would consume in one way or the other, but he would take a portion of that fruit and he would set it aside so that he could sow his field again next year. And that meant that each year the, the, the harvest from the year before would be the seed sown in the year afterwards. And just as that sower who goes out into the field to sow is the son of a 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 son of a, son of a sower... And his children, children's 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 children will be sowers. They will all be sowing basically the same seed because each year the seed sustains itself. And that's a vital part. If we are going to understand the battle plan of the kingdom, what Jesus has designed for his kingdom to grow throughout the world, we need to understand the idea that it is sustainable fruit that the sower is sowing, and that sustainable fruit is going to make the difference. Well, you know what happened next. After Jesus establishes his family as the disciples, that family gets on a boat and goes to the other side. Jesus says, let's go to the other side of the lake. He has a plan. Now, you also know that on the way, a great storm came up. And since I'm going to return to this part of the story later on, when we talk about the fear, and we notice that the disciples had fear, and the first kind of fear they had was a faith crusher, and the second was a faith builder. We'll talk about that in a little while. But ultimately, they come to the other side of the lake. Now, Jesus has just revealed himself to them as having power and authority over the winds and the waves, which means that he is, um, only God has that power, so it's a revelation of his deity. But that boat makes landfall on the other side. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And, and, and the sower goes out to sow. It's the exact same picture, except this time, the place where the boat lands is a demonic graveyard full of corruption and defilement. And of course, you know, as soon as they make land, that demon-possessed man comes rushing out, screaming like a banshee with, Ill, <laughs> with malevolence in his, in his mind. He, he's going to bring bodily harm to them. But that picture, we talked about how important that is, and we'll come back to that later on. But as soon as the demons in that man, and there were many of them, as soon as the demons recognized Jesus, what did they do? They, they caused the man to fall at Jesus' feet. And, and that's kind of where we're going to pick it up now, because Jesus says, come out of them. And, and ask the name, well, we are legion, because we are many. 
And, and, and they beg Jesus. They ask for mercy. These merciless creatures, these, these demonic beings, ask Jesus for mercy. And, and, and they, won't, they want not to be thrown into the abyss, but rather to be thrown into a herd of pigs. And that's exactly where we're going to pick it up today. So, so, so I'll, I'll go back to the text because we need to des- describe exactly what Jesus is doing and why he didn't destroy these evil beings when he uh, drew them out. So with that said, let's go back and take a look at the 32nd verse. I'm going to kind of flesh that out, that whole discussion later on, because we're going to try to look at this first from a very literal sense, a very physical sense. And I'm going to try to stay away from the spiritual part of it, but it's just going to leap off the page at us. We're not going to do a very good job of it. But then later on, to put it into the spiritual perspective that is so vital in this entire epic scene. So look at the 32nd verse. Now a large herd of pigs, Mark tells us that there were 2,000 of them, was feeding there on the hillside. Notice the peaceful pastoral scene. They're, They're feeding on the hillside. And the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Now, we talked about it last week. Jesus is in no way negotiating with evil, nor is I I don't think he's actually showing mercy to these guys. I think basically what we are seeing is the fact that it's not their time yet, that there is a time set by God when evil will be destroyed and Satan and his minions will be thrown into the lake of fire and everyone who has the mark of the beast on them as well, Revelation tells us. That time has not come yet, and Jesus knows it's not, so he is simply being obedient to his Father who has ordained ordained that there will be weeds in the middle of the wheat throughout the entire time of the church, but there will come a judgment, a time of judgment where they will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So that's the reason that he doesn't destroy these, 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 these evil beings. But then in the 33rd verse, we read that then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Now, I don't think that when we read that, we usually recognize the drama that is there. Now, we are told that the name of the the demon was Legion because we are many. And some scholars think that that means that there's actually 6,000 demons in that poor, pathetic man. Well, when Jesus cast out, I don't care if there are 6,000 or 600 or 60, whatever the number, can you imagine the, the, the feeling of evil and the movement and the sound that would occur when that number of demons come shrieking out of a man and they make the transition from that man to the pigs? The pigs, of course, are grazing peacefully, but as soon as the demons enter them, the pigs start shrieking and they begin the chaotic movement around because that's the kind of chaos that demons bring. And then all of a sudden, as if by some kind of of, of a direction, they turn and they stampede down that, 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 that incline with the herdsmen running behind them, yelling at the tops of their voices, trying to stop the inevitable. But no, the pigs run down and then you have the horrible scene of 2,000 animals rushing into the sea, thrashing and gasping for breath in their death throes, and then silence, absolute silence, not even the snorting of the pigs that were on the field before that. How dramatic that is. What a, what a setup it is for the scene that now follows. And we're going to zoom in on what happens, first of all, with the herdsmen. Look in the 34th verse. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Not just to the owner of the pigs, not just to the city, but this news spread like wildfire. Have you ever seen news spread through a a word of mouth society? You know that it can travel faster than it can on TV, boy, because it just goes from, from mouth to mouth. And the whole people started to know it, a whole group of people. Now, 
I think that there's two things basically that the herdsmen wanted to, to get across to the people. First of all, the supernatural has entered their natural world. That's important. The supernatural, because they have just witnessed something supernatural out of the ordinary. And secondly, they wanted to make sure that they ascribed blame. Okay, they want to make sure 2,000 pigs was worth, there's a lot of money wrapped up in 2,000 pigs. And so now they're all floating carcasses in, in the Sea of Galilee. And so those herdsmen want to make sure that the towns knows that this was not our fault. And they're pointing the finger right at Jesus. It was him. It was he who did it. All right. So that's what they're telling the townspeople when they run there. And so the townspeople come out. I don't think much time passes because Jesus and the, 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 the man and his disciples are still there. Look at the 35th verse. This is a, a vital verse for us to see. Then people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. So the town comes out, and I think basically there's three things that they want to find out. First of all, they want to see what on earth happened to these pigs. Secondly, they have heard that the supernatural has now manifested itself in their natural world. And thirdly, they want to see this man who has been accused of being the one who brought it all about. So they want to go check the whole situation out. Now, notice the first thing that we hear is that they came to Jesus. And, and that language is interesting because normally in Christianese, how do we use that phrase? They came to Jesus. Well, we talk about people coming to Jesus when they come out of darkness and into his marvelous light. When they come to know him as Savior and Lord. But nothing could be farther from the truth in this case. They did not come out to worship Jesus. They didn't even come out to thank him. <laughs> they're going to ask him to leave their presence, but that'll come in a moment. So they're not coming at recognizing Jesus for who he is. But then when they get out there, they see Jesus, and then they see this man, this ex-demoniac, if you will. And, and, and I want to zoom in on that man right now because he's hugely important. It's very important for us to see the difference between the raging insane, demon-possessed, naked man and the man who now is in the front of them. So let's take a look at what um, that the, the scripture tells us about it. First of all, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out. Now, don't miss that, brothers and sisters. This is a vital. If we're going to put this in a spiritual context later, I want to make sure that you see that the demons have left him. Jesus never does anything halfway. He never does it partially. He may do it in stages, but he never does it partway. So there is no vestige whatsoever of the demon left in this man. They are all gone. No matter how many thousands there might have been, they are all gone and the man is left cleansed. There is not a demon to be found. Okay, that's hugely significant later on when we look at the spiritual. Now, we see the man sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, what does that body language suggest? When you see someone sitting at the feet of someone else, it's a sign of subservience. It's a sign of humility. It's a sign of, of dedication. It's a sign that this man has now devoted himself. Later on, we're going to see that he tries to get into the boat and go home with Jesus. He's devoted himself. Jesus has changed his life. There's a complete and total change in this man. He's not running around the tombs anymore. He is at the feet of the one who saved him. That's hugely significant. Second, third thing that we see is that he's clothed. We talked about his nakedness last week and the fact that in scripture nakedness speaks of a shame that came with the fall. The first thing Adam and Eve recognized when they sinned against God was that they were naked. And God in his mercy covered them by killing some animals and covering them with their, their skins. Well, now this man who has spent many years running around the countryside, stark naked, is at the feet of Jesus and he is clothed. Where do you get the clothes? Where did he get the robe? Where did he get whatever he's clothed with? It's not his. Jesus provided that robe. And hopefully you're beginning to see the spiritual ramifications of what we're talking about. 
The man is clothed again. His shame is covered by a robe that Jesus has given him. And finally, the man is in his right mind. He is sane again. He is rational. He is able to think for himself. The demons have driven him into the desert, into the tombs, caused him to wail all night long and cut himself. He has lived in misery. And now, all of a sudden, that is over. He is gone. The man has his mind packed. He's logical and he's sane. There's a, a graphic image that we see. We have a bunch of pigs over here that are peacefully grazing on the sideline. And we have an absolutely maniacal man over here, demon-possessed. When the demons leave this man and go into the pigs, they become chaotic. They lose the, 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 the desire to live. They kill themselves. This man all of a sudden is at perfect peace. That's what Jesus does to people. Okay? Very important we see that distinction. Okay, so let's just, uh, I said that distinction is what is important. Look at the difference. Before this man was possessed by as many as 6,000 demons right now, he's completely free. When the Son of Man frees us, we're free indeed. He is completely free, not a demon to be found. Before he was in a state of enmity with the whole world, terrorizing anyone who came by, and especially at enmity with Jesus. But now he sits at Jesus' feet. Before he was in a state of chaos. Nothing, no one could control him. Now he's in perfect peace. Before he was naked and now he is clothed. Before he was insane and irrational. And now he's in his right mind. We need to make sure that we keep this distinction. Because the thing that is different in between those two is 100% Jesus Christ. We'll put that in the spiritual context later. Well, that's the man. So let's kind of zoom out again. We've seen him. That's the situation that he's in. Let's zoom out again and let's take a look at a vastly different picture as the townspeople come rushing out to see what's going on. Look at the very end of verse 35. And they were afraid. Now let's go ahead and read verse 36. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Okay, now, um, I, I want to talk about fear in a bit, but the reason I went ahead and read 36 is I want you to see what the basis of the fear is, why the people are afraid. Later on, at the end of the 37th verse, we are in the middle of it, we are going to see that they were seized with a great fear. And, and, and right now, what's happening, I think they were already afraid before they even got there, just for what they have heard already. But as the eyewitnesses begin to explain to them the supernatural occurrence that has just happened in their midst, it is the fear of that supernatural in the midst of their natural, normal, status quo world that is causing the great fear in them. But I want, I want to just kind of pause here, and please stay with me, because I'm trying to bring this whole epic story together. That if we were reading through this, just right through, we would notice that Luke has just presented us with four different situations of fear. And each one of them is a little different. So I want to go back and I want to look at the different kinds of fear and what the outcome of that fear was. And then I want us to ask ourselves, well, which one of the three previous fears does this group of people seem to have? What are they most closely like? Well, the first kind of fear, if you remember, of course, it was the disciples out on the sea when the storm came up. They were terrified. They, they went, ran to Jesus and they said, Jesus, we are perishing. And, and we noticed that that circumstantial fear that they had, rather than building their faith, actually kind of crushed it. Because whatever faith they had when they got on the boat, they lost when they thought that they were going to perish. And so that wasn't a faith-increasing fear. That was actually one that um, diminished their faith. And, and, and then we saw what happened. They went to Jesus. They cried out. We were perishing. They woke Jesus up. He stood up. He said to the winds and the waves, peace be still. And he turned to his disciples and said, where's your faith? <laughs> what? Did you really think this boat was going to go down? Now, a new fear hit the disciples at that time. 
A fear of the holy, because the only one who can command the wind and the water to abate and have the wind and the water obey him as that wind and water did is God, because he's the creator, and ultimately he's the only one who can do that. So Jesus has just revealed that he is God to his disciples. He is the holy. Now, they're they're, they're consumed with fear, as any of us would be when we are face-to-face with the holy. But the reaction on that group is totally different than it's going to be in the next fear, the fear of the demons, and the th- final fear, the fear of the people. So let me just kind of pause here and talk about what's different. Why does their fear of Jesus as God... They know he's God now. He's just revealed himself and they're scared to death. They are filled with this fear. Why does that fear lead to faith and belief and a deeper conviction and a deeper love to Jesus when it's not going to in any of the rest of them? Let's go back to the parable of the sower. There's four different kinds of soil. The hard path, the shallow path, the shallow dirt and the rocks and the ones amongst the thorns. It, 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 are those, it is those who are in the good soil. When they come face to face with the holy, when they come face to face with God, when they come face to face with the Holy Spirit, those are the only ones to whom the mysteries are revealed. They're the only ones who actually see Jesus for who he is. And so therefore, when they see the holy, that is translated into faith. Jesus himself said to his disciples, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. To them it has not. Because they have eyes and don't see and they have ears that don't hear. And so therefore, we see that the reason that their faith or their fear turns to faith is because of the condition of their souls. Remember what John said, you must be born again. There's no one who will enter the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Well, that's the kind of soul that we see in those disciples. The third fear that we are confronted with is the fear of the demons. Now, the word fear, the word afraid is not specifically used there, but we saw that when that demon, I mean, that demon possessed man is running at Jesus and the disciples, man, with every intention of doing them harm, as soon as the demons recognize that Jesus is who he is, they fall at his face, at his feet. And if you remember what they said, what have you to do with us now? Jesus, son of God, most high. There is one God, and the demons know it, and James says they know it, and they tremble. It terrifies them, and so they beg Jesus, don't throw us into the abyss. Throw us in to those pigs instead. And and, 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 and I just want you to, 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 to see that they recognize that Jesus is God, just like the disciples recognize that Jesus is God. What's the difference? What's the difference? How come the disciples, that turns into faith, and the demons, it turns into hatred and enmity against God because of the conditions of their being, their evil beings with evil souls and and, and, and evil intent. And so therefore, when they come face to face with the holy, as John said in his third chapter, they hate the light. And so therefore, they want to get out of the light as much as they can. So they beg Jesus, throw us in the pigs so that we will get out of the torment that we are under when we are in your presence. Because of the state of their being, because of their evilness, the the fact that Jesus is God drives them away from his presence with hatred and anger and a desire to find the darkness again so they continue to do their evil deeds. Which brings us to the fourth kind of fear. The people come out and, 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 and they see Jesus and they're immediately afraid because they're face to face with the supernatural. And later on, we're going to see that they're seized with a great fear because they're face to face with the supernatural. Now, that in and of itself is a perfectly normal reaction. I think any of us, when we were confronted, if we were confronted with the supernatural in that sense, would be terrified. There was a fear. But did the fear of the people who came out and saw Jesus, did that fear turn into faith and belief? Did they fall on their faces before him to worship him, to give him the glory, to recognize him as the holy? No, they didn't. Rather, they asked Jesus to leave. 
So which kind of fear is their fear the most like? That of the demons. You see, because they ask for the same thing the demons ask for, just in a different way. The demons ask to be thrown into the pig so they could get out of the presence of the light. The people ask for Jesus to leave so they could get out of the presence of the light. You're supernatural. We want to return to our status quo. We want to return to our mundane lives. In fact, you know, yes, this, this, this demon-possessed man was a menace to society. He was a real problem, but we sort of had him under control. And a devastating truth is revealed to us. The people preferred the demons to Christ. They actually would rather have the demon-possessed man. They're not going to thank Jesus. They would rather have the demon-possessed man in their midst, living outside in the tombs, terrorizing them, keeping their children up at night, than they would have Jesus in their midst. And so they ask him to leave. Oh, brothers and sisters, that is so huge. They are more comfortable with the, be- the demons than they were with Jesus. We see a tragic rejection. It's a rejection of the supernatural, but it is also a rejection of, of, of what Jesus can do. It's, it's just, it, it, it's kind of like, I, I, I want to keep the status quo, and I know that sounds kind, kind of silly, but in other words, Jesus as a supernatural has come and disrupted their lives. It disrupted their order of things. And, and basically what they are saying is, Jesus, we had everything just fine before you showed up. You know, we, yeah, we had this problem with the demon possessed man and yes, he was terrorizing us and yes, all these things were bad, but we also had 2000 pigs over there and all the money that they could bring us. So whatever it is you came to do, whatever you're capable of doing, yes, we have sick. Yes, we have needs. Yes, it would be wonderful for you to heal and transform so many of the people that we could bring for you, but we are able to take care of that. We don't need you. So leave. That is one of the most tragic things that we see. And also, brothers and sisters, that's irrational. That's irrational behavior. For Jesus to come there and to take what was a major menace to them, this man living in the tombs, a naked man running around terrorizing everybody who came by, blocking the road from the town to the sea, as I said, keeping their children up at night, Jesus comes and he he turns him into a law-abiding, rational, sane, decent individual who could be a positive impact on society. And they not that they... they, they they, they, they don't appraise him. They don't even thank him. They say, leave. Now, that's irrational. Spiritually, it's insane. So a very tragic uh, response from the people, but not nearly so tragic as what we read next. Make sure that you see this in the gravity in which it is. Look at the end of verse 37. So he got into the boat and returned. Jesus got into the boat and left. No attempt to save them. No attempt to change their minds. No attempt to teach them. No preaching. No healing. Wait a minute, I can show you some mighty miracles. I can show you many things that are going to make you believe in me. And so at least I can can have an impact on some of you. None of that. Jesus got in the boat and left them. The cry goes up amongst quite a few people, and they say, that's not fair. Jesus has the ability to save them. He should do it. So I think what we need to ask ourselves is this. What was Jesus' intent? What was the purpose of his mission? Please pay attention. Was it to go to the other side, to go into the city and, and, and to meet all the, uh, the ga- ga- garrisons, to share the gospel with them, to reveal that he's the light, to minister to them, to heal to the people that are there? And, and when he got there, they, they, they didn't respond to him. And so just like those kids in the marketplace, he took his toys and went home. I'm not going to play with you because you don't dance when I tell you to dance. 
Is that what the whole purpose is? Did Jesus just fail, in other words? Did he come so that he could go minister to the people of the Gerasenes and then he didn't do it? He goes home in defeat. Is that the message that he is there to teach his disciples and to us? This is the battle plan of the kingdom. If they don't like you, leave. (laughs) No. Jesus never, ever failed to complete a task. Always. That's the whole reason that he was absolutely exhausted in the back of the boat. Because he's been up all night. He, the rigors of his ministry were incredible. He would heal everyone who was there. At a great expense to himself. So Jesus always finished his task. I mean, sometimes it took a while. Sometimes he did it in stages. But he never, ever went home and said, Boy, we really tried, but we failed. So what does that mean? Can you put two and two together? If Jesus leaves and he never does not complete a task, what does that mean? He'd completed his task. In other words, he'd done what he came to do. What? Are you telling me that Jesus took his disciples into the storm? And across the lake to the other side, at great expense to them, they thought they were going to die. And he goes into a foreign land. And the reason that he goes there is this one demon-possessed, screaming Mimi of a man that, that is stark naked. That's the reason he went over there? Yeah. There's no one that's too lost for Jesus. There's no one who's too defiled for Jesus. There's no one who's too powerful, too rotten, too wicked, too wretched for Jesus. And so he goes and he saves the man that he came to save. And then he turns around and he leaves. And people say, that's not fair. What about all the garrisons? What about all those people? No, Jesus has got to die for everyone. He has an obligation to everyone who is there. No, brothers and sisters, that's not unfairness. That is justice. They asked Jesus to leave, and Jesus left. That's not unfair. That is simply giving the people what they want. He's not even giving them what they deserve. He's giving them what they want. They want him out. They want the light gone. I want the darkness because my deeds are evil. I want to crawl under my rock. Throw us into the pigs. We don't want to be in your presence. That's what you want? God simply sometimes says, okay, I'll give you what you want. And he removes his hand of blessing. Well, that would be really tough if that's where this story ended. But it's not. You see, that's not the fullness of the battle plan of the kingdom of God. And so let's go ahead and finish the text. And then I'll try to put this all into a spiritual context. Look in verse 38. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away. Wow, that's backwards, isn't it? I mean, do you remember in Matthew how this whole thing started out with those two disciple wannabes coming to the the boat? And I want to go with you, but Jesus told them what they were going to be looking at, so they opted to stay behind. Now they've got a man that loves Jesus so much and is so dedicated to him that he wants to follow him, wants to be with him. And Jesus says, no. I mean, what a scene. The guy's probably climbing in the boat. And Jesus says, sorry, you need to stay here amongst all these people that you used to terrorize. Oh, but brothers and sisters, now we're starting to get to the, to the kernel, to the core of the battle plan of the kingdom, the sustainable fruit of the sower. Because that's what this man is. Look what Jesus says to him. In verse 39, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Mark tells us he went through the entire Decapolis, 10 cities of the Gentiles, telling everyone what Jesus had done. And this man's not an apostle, he's not a theologian, but he has something of unestimable power. He has a testimony to what Jesus has done in his life. And he goes around and he tells everyone. This is what Jesus did for me. Praise God that it didn't stop with Jesus going home. 
Praise God that this man who was just minutes ago a demoniac is now an evangelist. Praise God that he was just a few minutes ago unclean, defiled, naked, absolutely insane, and now he's a missionary. You see, that's what God does to people. That's what Jesus does to people is turn them around and take broken vessels, people of absolutely no value, that, that, that have no skills, give them a testimony, and then send them out in the world to be the sustainable fruit of the sower. Brothers and sisters, that's how the kingdom grows. That's why we're here. So hopefully you can see the spiritual ramifications here going all the way back to that passage by John. John tells us that God has a plan of redemption. He sent his son into the world to save the world. And whoever believes in him will have eternal life. It is just that simple. But he says, whoever doesn't believe in him, it's not a sugar-coated gospel. It's not a one-side gospel. Whoever doesn't believe in him is already condemned. You're in a state of condemnation, just like that man living in the tombs. He's condemned. There's no hope for him. Nothing can change his life except Jesus Christ. So you must be born again. And if you're born again, something amazing happens. The demon-possessed man is turned into a sane man at the foot of Jesus. You see, we see a complete and total turnaround. Once again, Jesus says, I say to you, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. That's the difference between the way the disciples reacted to the, the, the present or, or, or being in the presence of God and, and the demons or the people. It's because they're planted in the good soil, even if they might have been the, 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 the path before when Jesus transforms them. Once again, whoever believes is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. So there are different kinds of soils. And yet Jesus goes into the far reaches of the world, into the very belly of the beast, into the darkest places where it seems that evil reigns. And he transforms lives. He takes away the sins. What a beautiful picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ because Jesus is the one who turns us in from from demoniacs. And by the way, brothers and sisters, don't miss this this whole scenario. (laughs) Don't look at this demoniac and say, oh, what a disgusting creature because spiritually speaking, that's you and it's me. You see, that's where we are spiritually and, and, and that's the picture that we are given we, we have no capability of saving ourselves. We are driven. We are under the thumb of Satan. We are bound by our own sins. We are slaves to our sin. And so, we, therefore, we need a redeemer. We need a savior. We need someone to come and set us free, just like Jesus did when he cast the demons out. That's the only way any of us are ever going to be redeemed. But that's what Jesus did on the cross. And you know this. He died on the cross for our sins. So we could be forgiven. So that those sins could be paid for. We call that propitiation. So that those sins could be removed from us. Just as Jesus took those demons and cast them into the pigs. He takes our sinfulness and he removes them as far as the east is from the west. But that's not all he does, is it? He clothes us. He he clothes us. With his righteousness, you're still not going to be able to stand before God with your righteousness. You can't. I mean, I don't care how good you are. Your own righteousness is not enough to get you into the presence of a holy God. You will be instantly destroyed. You would would be so far more than these demons who are in in the presence of of, of the earthly manifestation of the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. You stand in the presence of the all powerful holy God. You would do anything to get out of his presence because it scares you so much. The only way you are going to stand in the presence of God is if you are covered and robed and clothed in perfect righteousness. And that's what Jesus does. Those are the the robes that are needed for the wedding feast of the Lamb. And those who will not be considered as imposters and thrown into the outer darkness. 
where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so therefore, we see the beautiful picture here of the, of the redeemed, of, of the born-again man in his right mind, at the feet of Jesus, clothed with not even a trace of the demon in him. By the way, brothers and sisters, please mark this down. It would be ludicrous. It would be an absolute aberration of this story. If that man, after Jesus had thrown out the demons, continued to run around the tombs, a naked man screaming in the night. You see, that's gone with the old man. The new man is at the feet of Jesus, sane in his mind. Okay, this idea that you accept Jesus, but there's no change in your life is absolutely ludicrous, and it is not taught by Scripture. What is taught by Scripture is that there is a recognizable, demonstrative, radical change in the demon-possessed man and in us as well. But then there's the people who come out from the town. And, 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 and once again, th this is so tragic because basically what they have said is we don't need you. Now, most of the world today says, Jesus, we don't need you. We're doing just fine by ourselves. In fact, we kind of like our sin. We, we kind of like the darkness. We, we kind of like to dance with that. So therefore, thank you, but no thank you. Go, go on back to where you were. We just don't need any prophet from Nazareth coming here, messing with our lives. That's pretty much the way it is now. It, it, is people would rather be in the darkness than, 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 the, than the light, just exactly as John said. And the reason is, is because their deeds are evil and the light blinds them with the holiness and the righteousness of Christ. And so therefore, they, they go to that. But as I said earlier, the most tragic thing about this is that Jesus leaves. Brothers and sisters, when a people turn their back on God, when a people refuse to worship Him, refuse to acknowledge Him, refuse to give Him the glory, refuse to obey him, in fact, refuse to even acknowledge that he exists. After a while, God just removes his hand. He just gives them over to their base selves. Paul says it this way in, in Romans, therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Jesus again said, in the midst of this parable, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. To them I speak in parables so that seeing they will not see and hearing they will not understand. And Once again, what's the response? That's not fair. How can you hold them accountable if you, they don't have ears, if, if, if they don't have eyes? How can you hold them accountable? But wait a minute. This passage dispels that entire notion that God is unfair unless he saves everyone. Because everyone has the chance. Paul says that. that what they've known about God was perfectly clear from what was made. And so therefore, what they've actually done is ask Jesus to go away. Oh, now, of course, they're going to stand before the judgment at the end of time and say, I never knew that this was in front of me. But yes, you did. <laughs> and yes, you do. Because I just told you. I just told you that there is no other way that you're going to stand in the presence of God except through Jesus Christ and belief in him because only Jesus can save you. If you decide that you don't want Jesus in your life, then you are asking him to go home and don't be surprised if he gets in his boat and he leaves. But once again, that's not where the story ends. And that's not where the kingdom of God ends. Because God is merciful and he is loving and he gives second chances just like he gave to Jonah and just like he gave to me. Brothers and sisters, I rejected the gospel hundreds if not thousands of times before finally at almost 40 years old I accepted it. Not a, finally, it got through. So God didn't give up on me. He, he knew there was going to be a process that it would take. And so he left seeds of the sower. He left sustainable fruit. So that, that throughout the ages, this year's harvest will be next year's sower. And on and on and on it goes. 
And so don't be, don't, don't be surprised if, 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 if your spiritual grandparents, 2,000 years removed, might have been this demoniac who told people about what had happened to them. Now, of course, you're, 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 you're not apostles. Many of you are not theologians. Many of you think that I don't have any words to say. I'm not articulate. I, I'm afraid of, uh, and, and I don't feel that I'm, I, I'm knowledgeable enough to enter into a conversation. Well, I'm not saying that's okay. I think we all need to be able to share our faith. But you attain, if you are the Lord's, you have the most powerful story that anyone has. You have your testimony. And you can tell people about what Jesus has done in your life. You can tell them how he changed you. You can tell them how he pulled you out of darkness. But do not be surprised if they don't fall over. Don't be surprised if they say, thank you very much, but why don't you and your Jesus just get out of here? Because we actually don't need him and we don't need you. We don't need your superstition. We don't need your crutch. We don't need any of that. We've got life completely under control. And so... Perhaps it's not you, perhaps it's someone else. Perhaps it's another fruit of the sower that will come years from now. And so, brothers and sisters, we see the very core of what it means to be a kingdom dweller. We see the very core of the kingdom. We see how the kingdom is going to grow. It is going to grow through the sustainable fruit of the sower. And people who are, are, have their lives changed... And do nothing more. I mean, there's other people that will, but some will do nothing more than to tell other people what Jesus has done in their hearts. And every one of you can do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have made this so clear to us. I know that my words are totally inadequate here to, to get this hugely significant message across. There's so many aspects of it. There's so many um, uh, uh, nuances, so many lessons, so many things that we can take to heart here. It's hard, it, it's hard to cram them all into uh, to one, um, one discussion. But I pray that through your spirit, and I know that he's the one that takes my poor attempts and applies them in the hearts of the people. I pray that, you, I pray that your spirit will do just that, will will illuminate the hearts and minds so that we understand that we are looking at the most extraordinary plan for the growth of the kingdom of heaven and it is still here today and we are all part of it if we are yours. So we ask this, your blessing and this illumination in the name of Christ. Amen.